Hey everyone, I'm out in the shop and I wanted to play with magnetrons so I uh, took my microwave apart and here's the magnetron here. This is the device that actually creates the microwaves that cook food and what I want to do is characterize the voltage and current uh, requirements of the magnetron. So I've got some projects in mind that will come up later but right now I'm just measuring one of these to, to see what it's, how it works. Um, so a magnetron is a vacuum tube with a filament and an anode and it works by swirling around electrons. Uh, there's two large magnets. If you've ever taken one of these apart you'll see there's two donut shaped magnets in there and the magnetic field causes the electrons to swirl around in a spiral and uh, the speed at which they're swirling around past a number of cavities in there uh, determines the frequency of the microwaves generated. So pretty much all modern ovens operate at 2.45 gigahertz and the frequency is determined by uh, the number of cavities that you've got and the magnetic field strength. So here's a terrible little schematic diagram. In the center there's a, a coiled filament and the filaments are quite uh, heavy duty in these tubes because they're transmitting so much power. So the filament is heated up uh, by about maybe 4 volts AC and maybe 5 to 10 amps and so it's a really powerful filament. Maybe it's only 5 amps, but it's, it's a lot for a filament. It's dumping out quite a lot of power. And the electrons are emitted from the hot filament and they're attracted towards this outer ring of cavities. But as the electrons make their way from the filament towards the anode, they actually start spiraling around because this entire cavity is in a magnetic field. So as the electrons are emitted from the center and spiral around, they uh, move past these cavities and the speed at which they move past the cavities is determined by the magnetic field strength. So if you, if you take a little tap off one of these cavities you can draw off some RF energy. So basically just as, it's sort of like blowing wind past a um, uh, you know like a reed or something or blowing wind past an open pipe. You get some resonance going on in here and you can take off some of the energy. So this I mean, these things are, you know, a dime a dozen. You can get a microwave oven for well under $100 now. And uh, th this, you, can, you know, it's over a kilowatt of transmit power. So these, these devices are actually very simple in operation. Schematically, they look like this. Here's your two filament leads coming in. And that's the anode. And this is this little, it's, it's almost a symbolic representation of this little takeoff uh, line. So that's actually how you get the RF energy out of the microwave. The circuit is almost ridiculously simple. Pretty much all microwaves that I've seen are set up just like this. So when the microwave you know, decides that it should be running, you've passed all the interlocks and the, the cook timer is running, it puts power onto this transformer, 115 volts line voltage onto this transformer, and one secondary on the transformer is high voltage, it's probably about uh, 2,000 volts, maybe 2,500 open circuit or something like that. And it's set up with this simple voltage divider. So during half the cycle, this capacitor gets charged up. And during the other half of the cycle, this capacitor is put in series with a negative voltage on this line here. So when, when this line is positive and this is negative, the capacitor is charged through the diode. Then when the, when the uh, phase changes uh, to negative here, then this capacitor is in series with the negative voltage on this transformer and it pumps negative voltage into the magnetron tube. While this is all going on, the filament has just kept hot all the time. So the filament has its own little winding on the transformer and um, it's, it's 3 or 4 volts AC, at, you know, 5 or 10 amps or something like that. So what this means is that the magnetron is actually not transmitting half the time. So if you have uh, 60 hertz power, during the negative half of the cycle, uh, this isn't doing anything at all. It's just charging up this capacitor. And during the other half, then the magnetron is actually transmitting. So you'll see a little later in the video where I sort of surprised myself. I, I didn't even realize this myself until I did some more careful measurements. So anyway, so what I'm really interested in doing is finding out what this graph looks like for a magnetron. If it's current versus voltage, if you put a little bit of, and let's assume the filament is already hot, and, and up to, to, to temperature. Uh, you can put a little bit of voltage on it, a little more, a little more. Eventually, you know, no current really flows until you get up to about four kilovolts. And then suddenly you get tremendous current gain. And as far as I know, this line just continues essentially straight up. So 
you can never have a voltage drop greater than maybe four kilovolts for, for this type of magnetron. You can just keep dumping more and more current through them. So for my application, I want a really high pulse of power. So uh, what I'm going to do is charge up a capacitor bank and dump the capacitor bank through the magnetron. And as soon as the, the applied voltage goes over 4 kV, you should get a transmit pulse. And um, you can get much, much higher peak powers um, than, than you could just by supplying it with a transformer like this. OK, here's my next setup. So I took the filament wire off the capacitor terminal and soldered it in line to the high voltage wire going to the magnetron. So this way I could keep the filament currents out of my way and I could measure just the magnetron current going in, the emission current. So I've got the high voltage probe hooked up to the line and I've also got the current probe clamped onto the line. Uh, should be sensing just the uh, emission current. So let me point this at the scope and you can see what the startup behavior is like. Okay, I'll put this on auto, and I'll start the microwave now. So you can hear it takes a few seconds for it to stabilize, and after it comes up to power, it, it sort of, the curve is quite repeatable, so you can sort of trust what's going on here. So I'm just going to press single and grab a, a single acquisition. And we've got the same really unusually square looking square wave, uh, zero volts, negative four kilovolts. And on the current side, I switched this to 100 millivolts per division, and the zero is here. So in the positive, or in the zero part of the waveform, there's zero current, as we'd expect. And in the negative part of the waveform, it kind of gets down to about an amp, and then trails back off, and it spends most of its time at about negative one amps one amp, which is still way too much. That would mean this this thing is drawing three kilowatts input, which is far more than it, than it, than it is. It's probably three times less than that. So I'm still trying to figure out how to get a, a resistor into the high side. The problem is that, you know, I even, I even put a one ohm resistor there that you can see. Um, I really don't want to float this. I mean, even if I had an isolation transformer big enough to handle the microwave, uh, floating this thing would mean that the entire case would be 4,000 volts uh, different from the from ground, from real earth ground, because I'd have to connect that to my scope. I could also float the scope, but then that means that the scope case would be three or 4,000 volts above ground, which or below ground, or whatever it is, it's going to be bad. So um, I'd rather not do that either. So now that I look at it, uh, this is actually probably correct. I, I changed the scale on the current probe so that now we've got one volt per amp, or one division per amp on the current trace, which is one. The voltage trace is still two, and it's uh, two kilovolts per division. And A is the product of the two, so A is power. And uh, I used the scope's measurement feature to get the mean value for power across one full cycle, so it's gated on these two bars here. And lo and behold, 1.33 kilowatts so that's actually about right. Uh, microwave ovens are, you know, 1,200 kilowatts in, and the magnetron's probably outputting seven to 800 watts of microwave power. But yeah, 1,200, 1,300 watts in, that's, that's pretty reasonable. So what's interesting is that the current trace lags behind the voltage trace by uh, quite a bit, almost a full division here, and we're at two milliseconds per division. So I'm not sure, th this actually might be an artifact of the current measurement probe. Uh, there's probably some low-pass circuitry in the probe that's just causing some delay there. I, I find it hard to believe that the voltage jumps right up to 4 kilovolts, and then and there's 2 milliseconds later the current starts rising. I, I don't believe that. Um, so there's probably some inaccuracy in here, but I'm still surprised that the, that the number there is, is as close as it is to reality. So what I forgot to mention was that in this part of the cycle when the magnetron is actually firing, sure, maybe it averages, you know, 3, three kilowatts, but when you average it across the whole cycle, we're down to below one and a half kilowatts, which, which makes sense. So in the, when the microwave is running, half of the cycle is used just to charge the capacitor, and then the other half of the cycle is when the thing fires and it's drawing power, plus using the power that was stored in the capacitor. So 
really you could say that your microwave oven is a 4 kilowatt or a 3 kilowatt device. It's just only running half the time, basically. Okay, I hope that was helpful. I will keep you posted on my high power magnetron experiments.